All right, we are gonna do a study today on when does the new covenant come in? There was an old covenant back that uh, was given to Moses, and we're gonna see about this, and there's gonna be a new covenant coming. When does it come in? We're gonna start out in Exodus chapter 24. Get your King James Bible. It's very important that you use a King James Bible if you speak English. The other ones are from the Vatican. And I'll be showing you that they are corrupt and satanic in another video uh, because they change the timing of the coming in of the New Covenant. The New Covenant has not come in yet. Unless you use uh, one like this one over here, the English Standard Version or perhaps the uh, NIV or the New King James or the... You know, there's a bunch of them over here. I'll be showing this in another video. But the fact of the matter is they teach that the New Covenant came in with Jesus Christ, that Jesus brought in the new covenant. Jesus didn't bring in the new covenant. The new covenant is going to be out into the future. All right. And the purpose of this study is to go over the scriptures to show the old covenant and then when the new covenant comes in. So let's start out here. Exodus chapter 24, verses 1 through 8. And he said unto Moses, Come up unto the Lord, thou and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and, and seventy of the elders of Israel, and worship ye afar off. And Moses alone shall come near the Lord, but they shall not come nigh, neither shall the people go up with him. And Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord, and the, all the judgments, and all the people answered with one voice, and said, All the words which the Lord hath said will we do. And Moses wrote all the words of the Lord, and rose up early in the morning, and built an altar unto the, under the hill, and twelve pillars according to the twelve tribes of Israel. And he sent young men of the children of Israel, which offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen unto the Lord. And Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins, and half the blood he sprinkled, sprinkled on the altar. Here we go, verse seven. And he took the blood of the, the excuse me, he took the book of the covenant and read in the audience of the people. And they said, All that the Lord hath said will we do and be obedient. And Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant which the Lord hath made with you concerning all these words. All right. The blood of the covenant brought in, you know, Moses there is the one that's taking care of this whole thing, sprinkling the blood on the people and on the, on the book. Exodus chapter 34. Exodus chapter 34. Turn there next. Verse 27 and verse 28. Read these two verses. Exodus 34 verse 27 says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Write thou these words, I have made, oh, excuse me, for after the tenor of these words, I have made a covenant with thee and with Israel. And he was there with the Lord forty days and forty nights. He did neither eat bread nor drink water. And he wrote upon the tables the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. All right, so the Ten Commandments are part of that old covenant that was given there to the people of Israel, the Jewish people. All right, it's very interesting. But again, it was written, it was given to Moses, him being kind of the mediator between God and the nation of Israel. Next, let's go to Leviticus chapter 26. Leviticus chapter 26, beginning in verse 14. <clears throat> I read this in my study on the thing of the difference between testament and covenant, but we're going to go over these verses again because it's very important. Leviticus chapter 26, verse 14. But if ye will not hearken unto me, and will not do all these commandments, and if ye shall desire, excuse me, despise my statutes, or if your soul abhor my judgments, so that ye will not do any of my commandments, but that ye break my covenant, I also will do this unto you. I will even appoint over you terror, consum or consumption, and the burning egg, uh, or ague, however you say that, that shall consume the eyes and cause sorrow of heart, and ye shall sow your seed in vain, for your enemies shall eat it. Okay, let me just stop right there. Notice that this covenant that God made with Moses there for the and the children of Israel, this covenant is conditional. It's not like the Abrahamic covenant, which is, it's perpetual. It's, there's no conditions put on it. The Jews are going to get that land someday. 
that God promised to them, you know, um, this one's conditional. This Mosaic covenant is a conditional covenant. Verse 17, And I will set my face against you, and ye shall be slain before your enemies. They that hate you shall reign over you, and ye shall flee when none pursueth you. And if ye will not yet for all this hearken unto me, then I will punish you seven times more for your sins. And you're going to see that repeated four times in this passage. There are four sets of, where it says seven times, you're going to be judged seven times and whatever else. We'll get back to that here in a minute. Verse 19, And I will break the pride of your power, and I will make your heaven as iron and your earth as brass. And your strength shall be spent in vain, for your land shall not yield her increase, neither shall the trees of the land yield their fruits. And if you will walk contrary unto me, and will not hearken unto me, I will bring seven times more plagues upon you according to your sins. I will also send wild beasts among you, which shall rob you of your children, and destroy your cattle, and make you few in number, and your highways shall be desolate. And if ye will not be reformed by me, by these things, but will walk contrary unto me, then will I also walk contrary unto you, and will punish you yet seven times for your sins. And I will bring a sword upon you, that shall avenge the quarrel of my covenant. And when ye are gathered together within your cities, I will send the pestilence among you, and ye shall be delivered into the hand of the enemy. I just got to say this real quickly. I just saw here recently, um, actually this morning, pretty recent, I saw that the uh, nation of Israel is now saying that sodomites um, are allowed to donate blood freely over there. No screening, no testing, no whatever. They, they do it and then four months, I think, later, they come in and they, they can donate blood again. And if they find any disease, well, then they'll get rid of the blood. But if they don't find any disease, well, then that's okay and whatever. Foolish, foolish. Sodomites are, are majorly... Uh, infected with HIV and all kinds of other sexually trans transmitted diseases. And they're going to have them donating blood? It's insane. What's going on? Fulfillment of Scripture. They reject Jesus Christ. They reject God's laws and things. And the Lord says, okay, I'm going to send pestilence in. I'm going to send in all kinds of horrible other plagues because you reject me. Still true to this day. Here, you know, March 30th of 2018, these words still ring true. Verse 26, And when I have broken the staff of your bread, ten women shall bake your bread in one oven, and they shall deliver your, you your bread again by weight, and ye shall eat and not be satisfied. And if ye will not for all this hearken unto me, but walk contrary unto me, then I will walk contrary unto you also in fury, and I, even I, will chastise you seven times, for your sins, and ye shall eat the flesh of your sons, and the flesh of your daughters shall ye eat. That actually happened in Scripture. They were besieged, and they ran out of food, and they were actually eating their own children. Yeah, it can get that bad. Verse 30, And I will destroy your high places, and cut down your images, and cast your carcasses upon the carcasses of your idols, and my soul shall abhor you. And I will make your cities waste, and bring your sanctuaries unto desolation. And I will not smell the savor of your sweet odors. And I will bring the land into desolation, and your enemies which shall dwell therein shall be astonished at it. And I will scatter you among the heathen, and will draw out a sword after you, and your land shall be desolate, and your cities waste. Then shall the land enjoy her Sabbaths, as long as it lieth desolate, and ye be in your enemies' lands. Even then shall the land rest, and enjoy her Sabbaths. As long as it lieth desolate, it shall rest, because it did not rest in your Sabbaths when ye dwelt upon it. And upon them that are left alive of you, I will send a faintness into their hearts in the lands of their enemies, and the sound of a shaken leaf shall chase them, and they shall flee as fleeing from a sword, and they shall fall when none pursueth. And they shall fall one upon another, as it were before a sword when none pursueth, and ye shall have no power to stand before your enemies." And the Jews certainly have been kicked around in, in every country, country that they've ever lived in. They get powerful, but then they get persecuted and they get, you know, stomped on and things, especially the lower level Jews, the ones that aren't really rich and highly connected. So these scriptures, again, they're absolutely right, absolutely have been fulfilled. Verse 38, And ye shall perish among the heathen, and the land of your enemies shall eat you up. 
And they that are left of you shall pine away in their iniquity in your enemies' lands, and also in the iniquities of their fathers shall they pine away with them. It's interesting, you know, pine away means you get skinnier and skinnier, you're slowly dying. Uh, interesting that uh, you saw that with the death camps in Nazi Germany. These Jews that were there in these death camps and they're pining away, they're getting so skinny and things. Why? Well, they rejected Jesus Christ. It's a tragic, sad thing. But uh, God made a covenant with them through Moses. Moses, they claim that they revere Moses, and yet they turn against the covenant that uh, was made between him, Moses, and God for the children of Israel. Hmm. A lot of bad things happen as a result. <clears throat> uh, verse 40. If they shall confess their iniquity and their, in the iniquity of their fathers, which the, with their trespasses which they trespassed against me, and that also they have walked contrary unto me, and that I also have walked contrary unto them, and have brought them into the land of their enemies, if then their uncircumcised hearts be humbled, and they then accept of the punishment of their iniquity, then will I remember my covenant with Jacob, and also my covenant with Isaac, and also my covenant with Abraham, and I will remember, and I will remember the land. You see, God will remember the Abrahamic covenant. That's what's being talked about there. It's made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Because if it's just made to Abraham, well, then the descendants of Ishmael could say, well, see, you know, we get in on the promises for the land too. Like a lot of them try to do, it's, it's the land of Palestine. There's no such thing. There's no such thing. It's the land of Israel. God promised it to the descendants of Abraham through Isaac, through Jacob. Jacob being the father of the 12 sons, 12 tribes. Jacob is later called Israel. Again, the time that's coming in the future is the time of Jacob's trouble. Israel's trouble. You know, that's what's going on there. So God says, hey, you break the Mosaic Covenant, I'm going to be angry with you, but if you repent, then I'll remember the Abrahamic Covenant. The Mosaic Covenant was not everlasting. The Abrahamic Covenant was. Verse 43. The land also shall be left of them, and shall enjoy her Sabbaths, while she lieth desolate without them, and they shall accept of the punishment of their iniquity, because even, be, because, even because they despised my judgments, and because their soul abhorred my statutes. Yeah. Interesting. So you have verse 18, verse 21, verse 24, and verse 28. Each one of those is about seven judgments. What do you have in the time of Jacob's trouble? that the book of Revelation records. You have seven years, seven seals, seven trumpets blown, and seven vials poured out. Hmm. How about that? God's giving them that last one little bit of time of saying, okay, you broke my covenant, the Mosaic covenant, so I'm going to pour out all this bad stuff on you. I'm going to give you the judgment, the four sevens judgment. All right. Um, it's going to be a bad time for them. Very bad time. If you're Jewish, you can get saved right now. All right? You don't have to go into the time of Jacob's trouble. You can get saved and get out of that you know, time period that's coming. But you get these replacement theology people, these ones that print these new Vatican versions like this junk over here, and you get this and they say, well, the new covenant came in with Jesus Christ. You know, it's not the New Testament. It's the new covenant that came in there. And they mess all kinds of stuff up there. And they say, well, see, the church has replaced Israel and, and whatever else. So, you know, it just it, it messes the whole thing up. And then they'll try to say they'll take that and they'll try to say, well, see, I think the Abrahamic covenant, because we're born in by a, a spirit of adoption, you know, the New Testament talks about that, where Abraham's seed by a spirit of adoption, in other words. Um, so the, those promises, the everlasting covenant, the Abrahamic covenant, comes to the church now. Absolute total lie. You know, complete lie. And the new covenant is not for the church either. I'm going to show you that today. Uh, the new covenant is yet to come. It didn't come in with Jesus Christ, as I've said earlier. Again, I will be proving that. But look at this. All this bad stuff is going to happen to the Jews in the time of Jacob's trouble. But look at the next verse, verse 44 through 46 here. We'll read that. And yet for all that, all the bad stuff the Lord's doing to them, when they be in the land of their enemies, I will not cast them away. Neither will I abhor them to destroy them utterly and to break my covenant with them, for I am the Lord their God. 
God's not going to break that everlasting covenant, the Abrahamic covenant. God gives them the Mosaic covenant and says, okay, it's up to you to keep this. If you obey me and keep it, everything's going to go good. If you disobey me and break it, I'm going to send all kinds of judgment. But because of the Abrahamic covenant, I'm not going to destroy you utterly. Verse 45, But I will for their sakes remember the covenant of their ancestors, whom I brought forth out of the land of Egypt in the sight of the heathen, that I might be their God, and I am that I might be their God, I am the Lord. These are the statutes and judgments and laws which the Lord hath made between him and the children of Israel in Mount Sinai by the hand of Moses. So not only does God remember the Abrahamic covenant, God also says, even though you broke the Mosaic covenant, I'm still going to remember that. I'm still going to remember that agreement there, that law, those Ten Commandments. God still remembers it. And He restores it. But this time, He doesn't leave it up to them to have the free will to obey or reject or, you know, whatever. He doesn't count on them and their moral convictions or, or you know, whatever to keep the law. It doesn't happen. Let me show you. Jeremiah chapter 30. Jeremiah, go to the book of Jeremiah chapter 30. Now, if you remember what we just read there in Leviticus chapter 26, verses 14 through 43, you see the thing of the 4 7 judgment that's coming to the nation of Israel. And then God says, I'm not going to, you know, even. And yet for all that, I still remember my, those two covenants. He remembers the Abrahamic covenant and he remembers the Mosaic covenant. He still remember the, remembers those. right? But it starts out this time of Jacob's trouble, which we're going to read about here in this passage, and then it goes to the new covenant. But the whole purpose of this study is when does that new covenant come in? At the end of the time of Jacob's trouble or in the time of Jacob's trouble? I'll show you what I believe on that. Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 1 through 9. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord God of Israel, saying, Write thee all the words that I have spoken unto thee in a book. For lo, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will bring again the captivity of my people Israel and, the, and, and Judah, saith the Lord, and I will cause them to return to the land that I gave to their fathers, and they shall possess it. And these are the words that the Lord spake concerning Israel and concerning Judah. Not the church, not Christianity, or whatever else. Uh-uh. See, what people have to get into their minds is this, what many call the church age, is a period of time where God is dealing with both, both Jews and Gentiles. But when the catching away of the body of Christ happens before the time of Jacob's trouble, when that event occurs, God says, okay, I'm not going to deal with the Gentiles anymore. There will be some that get saved, certainly. There will be a great multitude that gets saved according to Revelation chapter 7. That's true. But God's attention turns back to the nation of Israel. And see, people, Christians, I'll say it that way, saved Christians have this idea that we have this special place in the Lord and we're just, you know, we're just the ones that are there and just goes on out into the future and God's plans just revolve all around us. That isn't true. That's not true at all. Yes, we do have a special place. Yes, we are there in God's plan. But you know what? When the Lord comes back down here to the earth to rule and reign, He rules and reigns from Jerusalem. All right? And He restores the Jewish people. The others are just kind of a sideline type of thing. I do believe that there will be other Gentiles that will be in that time period. But uh, it's not the same thing. You know, God's dealings with His church is not the same thing as Him dealing with the nation of Israel. He made covenants with the nation of Israel. God didn't make any covenants with the church, the Christian church. We have the New Testament. The Jews have the covenants of promise. Now, there's a spirit of adoption. I understand that. But it's not the same thing. And people have to get that into their minds. You know, oh, the, the, tribu the great tribulation is all about the church and purifying the church. It's ridiculous. It's crazy. Catholic, in other words. <clears throat> Verse 5, For thus saith the Lord, We have heard a voice of trembling, of fear, and not of peace. Ask ye now, and see whether a man doth travail with child, 
Wherefore do I see every man with his hands on his loins as a woman in travail, and all faces are turned into paleness. All right? Talking about that time of Jacob's trouble. We're going to read that in the very next verse. But why are these men, you know, like this? They can't eat. Why? To eat, you know, you're going to have to have the mark of the beast. No man can buy or sell unless you have the mark. They can't take it in that time period. It's going to be rough. No more job, no more bank account, no more mortgage, no more going to the grocery store, no more filling up your car at the gas station. It's over. You're done. Verse 7. Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. For it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord of hosts, that I will break his yoke from off thy neck, and will burst thy bonds, and strangers shall no more serve themselves of him. But they shall serve the, king, the Lord their God, and David their king, whom I will raise up unto them. You know, David their king being symbolic you know, of Jesus Christ, the coming Messiah. You know, he came the first time, I'm saying, but he comes back to fulfill the other prophecies concerning him ruling and reigning for a thousand years. So there you see that time of Jacob's trouble. Again, the first part of Leviticus chapter 26, verses 14 through 43, you have all these bad things happening to the Jewish people and the four seven judgments. All right. Then Leviticus chapter 26, verses 40 through 40. 44 through 46, then you have God remembering his covenant, both covenants, Abrahamic and Mosaic, and he again starts to deal with the people of Israel. Go to Jeremiah chapter 31. We're going to see now about this thing of the new covenant. Jeremiah 31 verse 31. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break. Although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord. They broke the covenant, the Mosaic covenant. And this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more, no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. This is the new covenant. Okay? Verse 31. I will make a new covenant with the Christian church. Uh, no, it says, uh, with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah. It's a new covenant. You say, well, um, you see, Jesus brought that in in the first century. Really? Um, well, then how's that work out there? Verse 33, But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put, put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts. And they will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. Um, and that's the current state of the Jews over in Israel. Now that the new covenant came in, the new covenant hasn't come in yet. The New Testament came in. Jesus Christ brought in the New Testament. He did not bring the new covenant. And these Vatican versions over here, all these different ones like this, these things here all say covenant. Jesus brought in a new covenant. How's that possible? Well, see, you just have to spiritualize a few things. You say, well, um, you know, the church has replaced Israel. I mean, when it says Israel in the, the, the you know, here in uh, verse 31, uh, the house of Israel, the house of Judah, it's really just meaning Roman Catholicism, you know. <laughs> um, that new covenant there and, and everything. And let's just go with that for a minute, okay? The new covenant came in, the you know Israel here in Judah. That's actually the church, right? Well, then uh, you mean to tell me that uh, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts, and will be their God, and they shall be my people? That's true of the church. You mean to tell me that the church has people that have God's law in their minds, 
inward parts, in other words, and in their heart. Please, I don't think so. And I'll go even one step further than that. Not only just talking about you know Roman Catholicism, let's talk about saved Christians. Um, saved Christians always keep the law. It's written in their heart and mind. I don't think so. You know, Peter talked about, you know, we can't keep the, the, the law and things like that in the book of Acts. Well, if the new covenant came in, what's he doing? I mean, he's Jewish and a Christian. The new covenant didn't come in. The new versions are lying. They're not Holy Spirit inspired, which I'll be showing you in the next video. Well, let's continue. Let's go to the New Testament tie-in to Jeremiah 31. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 1 through 13. The whole chapter, in other words. We'll go down through this. It says here, Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum of we have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched, and not man. For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices, wherefore it is of necessity that this man have somewhat also to offer. Talking about Jesus Christ, in other words. For if he, for if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law who serve under the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern which to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. Hmm. Um having to keep the law and remember to keep the law and everything under the old Mosaic covenant versus now you don't even have to think about it. It's just automatically there. God's written his law into your inward parts according to Jeremiah 31 and it's in your heart. And nobody has to go out and say, hey, do you know about Jesus and things? Because they all know him. Um, I'd say that that's a better covenant. It's not in yet, but it's coming. Verse 7, For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them, notice that, the covenant was good, but the fault was with them, the Jews in the Old Testament, that broke that Mosaic covenant. Very interesting. He saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Well, whoa, wait a second here. This is New Testament here. I mean, this should be updated. I mean, Paul should have said, I believe Paul's the writer of Hebrews. You can disagree with that if you want to. But, I mean, whoever wrote Hebrews will say it that way. Um, they should have said, well, the church. The new covenant's with the church. Uh, no, it's with Israel and with Judah. And that hasn't happened yet. Verse 9. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. Hmm. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts. See? In the mind, in the heart. So when you read back in the Old Testament, the book of Jeremiah, chapter 31, it says inward parts. Uh, you know, well, it's talking about mind and heart. And I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. And that he saith a new covenant, he hath made the first old, now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. Hmm. Interesting. But I want you to notice a very interesting thing here. Verse 5, Who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. All right? 
And uh, then it goes on to talk about he, now he hath obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. Now, you can say that's about Jesus Christ, but you could also say in context it could be about Moses. You say, well, that's impossible because Moses is dead. He's dead and buried and gone and whatever else. Uh, yeah, but if you understand the Bible, there are two witnesses that come in the book of Revelation. Moses and Elijah. Done a lot of studies on that, showing and proving beyond a shadow of a doubt it's not Enoch and Elijah, it's Moses and Elijah. Moses is coming back. Could it be that he's going to be bringing in that new covenant? Hmm. Let's look about that. Revelation chapter 11. Revelation chapter 11, we'll read about the two witnesses here. Verse 1, And there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar, and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple leave out, and measure it not. For it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread under foot forty and two months. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the, the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy. And have power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. Interesting, because those things there in uh, verse 6 are the things, same kind of things that Moses and Elijah did in the Old Testament. Plagues and causing it to stop raining and, you know, turning water into blood. Hmm. Enoch didn't do any of that stuff, but Moses and Elijah did. Verse 7. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt. Hmm. Where also our Lord was crucified. Jesus, Jesus was crucified in Jerusalem. Isn't that interesting? Um, what was the first covenant, the Mosaic covenant there? That God remembered how he brought the nation of Israel out of Egypt by the hand of Moses. And here we have a future time period where Moses returns walking in the streets of Jerusalem, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt. Don't tell me it's all coincidence. It all ties together perfectly. Verse 9, And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and in half, and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. All the people in the world seeing Moses and Elijah being dead over in the streets of Jerusalem, that's not possible before the advent of satellite television or internet or whatever else you want to say. Hmm. Verse 10, And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. And after three days and in half the spirit of life from God entered into them and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven, saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. Hmm. So, again, I can't get into the whole big study, the detailed study of why the two witnesses are definitely Moses and Elijah, but I've done that in other videos. You can watch those. Uh, just search for the two witnesses or something like that on this channel. All right? So, um, but what about this new covenant thing? We definitely see a tie in there that Moses is coming back and Moses uh, is there coming in speaking to the Jewish people and Jerusalem in that time period is called Sodom and Egypt. Revelation chapter 7 verses 1 through 4. And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, 
having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and they were sealed in hundred and forty and four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel. So you have 144,000 Jews sealed. What is the seal that's in their forehead? What is that? Well, we read earlier about this new covenant that comes in, and it's God's law written in the heart and in the mind. What if that seal that's there for the 144,000 Jews, what if it's the new covenant? Hmm, you see, what well, doesn't say that. Yeah, I know. This is a theory. I'm presenting to you a theory, but I believe it makes sense. Let me show you something else. Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14, verses 1 through 5. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him an hundred and forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. So these are the ones that are from Revelation chapter 7, very clearly. Verse 2, And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song but the hundred and forty and four thousand which were redeemed from the earth. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Huh? How on earth could they be without fault before the throne of God? Unless they had the law of God written in their hearts. And they don't need to speak every, every man to his neighbor and things, saying, Know the Lord, because they all know the Lord. Hmm. What if the 144,000 get the new covenant in the time of Jacob's trouble, set up between God and Moses? The two witnesses, the 144,000 that are there, and they're witnessing to the nation of Israel. How about that? Moses is there and he says, God has established a new covenant with you. And to show you proof, here's the 144,000. Wouldn't it be something if God dropped 144,000 Jewish men? Well, not dropped, but, you know, had them there in the time of Jacob's trouble. However, that thing's going to work out. I don't believe that they're... Children that, you know, young Jewish males that were killed in the first century or something, you know, when Herod put out the decree and all that stuff, and they'll be resurrected. And th eh, I don't know. I don't know about any of that stuff. Uh, you know, people get into some of that theory type of thing, and I don't know. But the whole point is, however they get there, whatever the deal is, that's not relevant to the point we're trying to make here, all right? The fact of the matter is, there, these 144,000 are going to be there on the earth. And Moses could be saying, hey, as further proof here, the new covenant has come in. Don't try patching up the old covenant. That thing is it's decaying, as it says here in the book of Hebrews. Quote the book of Hebrews. That's done. That's over. Here's the new covenant. This is what it looks like. If you want that, you're going to go into the, new, the uh, millennial kingdom. And you better put your faith in Jesus Christ. And accept him as your Messiah. And wait for him. Endure to the end to be saved. In other words, Matthew chapter 24, verse 13 talks about that. Hmm. Go to Romans chapter 11. You say, I don't know. I think the new covenant already came in. Well, you're quite foolish and you need to be saved. If you believe the New Covenant's already here, you're lost. Your opinions don't matter on that issue. The New Covenant has not come in yet. I think we've clearly demonstrated that now. Romans chapter 11, verse 25. Here, but here's further proof if you're uh, still hard-headed or whatever. Romans chapter 11, verse 25 through 27. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits. 
that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in, and so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. How do you turn away ungodliness from Jacob, the nation of Israel? Uh, that would be in the time of Jacob's trouble, when Jesus Christ is revealed. Book of Revelation, the revelation of Jesus Christ. Hmm. And um, turn away ungodliness from Jacob by bringing in the new covenant. Yeah. You see, how do you know? Verse 27. For this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. Well, that came in the first century. No, because Paul is saying this thing's going to happen someday. How do, I'm not sure that you've proved your point. Look at verse 28. As concerning the gospel, right now in other words, they, the Jews, are enemies for your sakes. But as touching the election, there, the covenants and things, that election that God has a special choosing for those Jewish people, they are beloved for the Father's sakes. The fathers. Who are the fathers there? Uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. You see how that thing works? No, the new covenant has not come in yet. But it will be in the future. Ezekiel chapter 34. A couple more places to turn to here. Ezekiel 34. Verse 23 through 31. Okay, it says here, And I will set up one shepherd over them, and he shall feed them, even my servant David. He shall feed them, and he shall be their shepherd. And I, the Lord God, and I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David, a prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken it. And I will make with them a covenant of peace. And will cause the evil beast to cease out of the land, and they shall dwell safely in the wilderness and sleep in the woods. A good idea. I like sleeping in the woods. <laughs> and I will make them and the places round about my hill a blessing, and I will cause the shower to come down in his season. There shall be showers of blessing. And the tree of the field shall yield her fruit, and the earth shall yield her increase. And they shall be safe in their land, and shall know that I am the Lord, when I have broken the bands of their yoke, and delivered them out of the hand of them, of those that served themselves of them. So when does the covenant of peace come in? In the millennial kingdom. That's when people are going to be getting along with the animals. That's when there's not going to be any more war or any more fighting. All right? Until you get to the very end of it, when the Lord, you know, looses the devil out of the bottomless pit and he goes out to deceive the nations and things. But then it doesn't really last all that long. The Lord just totally wipes it out, just burns it. But the point is, the new covenant, the full new covenant comes in in the millennial kingdom. At the beginning of it, you know, I would say after the judgment of the nations, when he says, you know, come into the kingdom, you know, and things, you, you know, that's been prepared for you. They go in there, Matthew chapter 25 is when it's, I'm not quoting the verse, I'm not, you know, but you can go there and you can read that. They go into the kingdom, that's the new covenant. But I believe that they're going to see a little bit of a glimpse of that new covenant with the 144,000 Jews and Moses bringing it in and showing them, hey, I mean, who better to tell them about the old covenant being done away with than the guy that it was given to? You know, I mean, the Lord sends to the nation of Israel, um, hey, I'm going to tell you that the old covenant is disannulled. It's done. Well, we stick to the Torah, you know. And all of a sudden, you know, hi, here's this man standing there, and they say, who are you? And he says, Moses. Oh, by the way, that covenant that God made with me, the Mosaic covenant, yeah, it's no good. Here's the new covenant. And by the way, to show you how this thing's going to work, here's 144,000 Jews that are without guile. Probably, you know, a little impressive to the Jews in that time period. Ezekiel chapter 20, or excuse me, 36, verse 25. 
Ezekiel, Ezekiel 36, verse 25 says, then, I will, then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean from all your filthiness, and from all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart of your flesh, and I will give you an heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and ye shall keep my judgments, and do them. And ye shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers, and ye shall be my people, and I will be your God. I will also save you from all your uncleanness, and I will call for the corn, and will increase it, and lay no more famine upon you. Um, and I will multiply the fruit of the tree, and the increase of the field, that ye shall receive no more reproach of famine among the heathen. Then shall ye remember your own evil ways, and your doings that were not good, and shall loathe yourselves in your own sight for your iniquities and for your abominations. Not for your sakes do I this, saith the Lord God, be it known unto you. <laughs> be ashamed and confounded for your own ways, O house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord God, In the day that I shall have cleansed you from all the, your iniquities, I will also cause you to dwell in the cities, and the wastes shall be builded, and the desolate land shall be tilled, whereas it lay desolate in the sight of all that passed by. And they shall say, The land that was desolate is become like the Garden of Eden, and the waste and desolate and ruined cities are become fenced and are inhabited. Then the heathen that are left round about you shall know that I, the Lord, build the ruined places and plant that that was desolate. I, the Lord, have spoken it, and I will do it. Thus saith the Lord God, I will yet for this be inquired of by the house of Israel, to do it for them. I will increase them with men like a flock. As the holy flock, as the flock of Jerusalem in her solemn feasts, so shall the waste cities be filled with flocks of men, and they shall know that I am the Lord. It's the new covenant. Absolutely the new covenant. But I want to make a point here. It's a very important point. Um, verse 31. Okay, the Lord's doing all this stuff. He brings in the new covenant. You know, verse 27, I'll put my spirit within you, cause you to walk in my statutes, and you shall keep my judgments and do them. Um, the Lord brings in this new covenant, and he writes his laws into their hearts and minds, and, and you know, there he saves them as a people and just changes their minds on things. You know, again, Jesus Christ is walking around on the earth the first time here when he first came in the first century, and, and, and they're saying, you know, saying all kinds of things, and he's saying, you know, ye generation of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? He could have given them the new covenant right then and there. He could have said, hey, boom, I'm going to just change your minds. But he didn't do it. Jesus didn't bring in the new covenant in the first century. He brought in the New Testament. It's just disgusting. But look at this. This is very instructive about true salvation. This is so important. He does all the stuff. He, he gives them, you know, the new covenant there and changes their minds on things and, and, you know, and everything. Like what happens when you get genuinely saved. And look at this, verse 31. Then shall ye remember your own evil ways and your doings that were not good, and shall loathe yourselves in your own sight for your iniquities and not and for your abominations. Very interesting. Because that's exactly what a real true conversion will be. When somebody truly gets saved, when you become born again, when you have a new life given to you by Jesus Christ, you'll say, wow, it's just so amazing. My, my interests have changed. I just love to read the Bible. I'm just... I love the old hymns. I love this, the things of the Lord. They're so exciting. I want to tell people about Jesus. There's a major change. You know, the old hymn, what a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. All right? Yeah, there's going to be a huge change. But another thing that happens is, then shall you remember your own evil ways and your doings that were not good, past lost life, and shall loathe yourselves in your own sight for your iniquities and for your abominations. You know something that will come to your mind when you genuinely get saved as a Christian? You'll remember how you were before you got saved. And you'll think to yourself, I can't believe I did that. I can't believe the times that I laughed at the Bible, that I mocked the Lord, that I had pleasure and I did that. Oh, I don't even want to think about the stuff I did. I just, I'm so, why on earth would you save me, Lord? I don't understand. You sure got a bum deal when you got me. I mean, it's a changed life. It's a drastic changed life. 
And you see these people out there today and they're saying that a changed life is false salvation. <laughs> uh, you're dealing with lost people. You're dealing with people who have never experienced a supernatural rebirth, a supernatural act of God making you born again. They've never become a new creature in Christ Jesus. They've not experienced it. They don't loathe themselves from back when they were lost. There's no emotional thing there. It's just, oh, well, I'm, you know, we're all sinners, you know, I, I guess. You know, I prayed the prayer, I accepted Jesus, I believed, you know, whatever they say and, and whatever else. And you say, we're well, a pretty rotten individual before. Well, yeah, 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 yeah. They don't loathe themselves. But those that are truly born again, Christians I've had dealings with for years and years and years, and you look at your past life and you just say, oh, God, God, forgive me. Oh, I can't believe I did those. Oh, yeah. you know. <laughs> yeah. It's very true for us today. Godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation not to be repented of. All right. But the sorrow of the world worketh death. For, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10, I think it is. You know, it's just incredible the change that will happen in your life when you get genuinely born again. But these people that say, oh, there was really no change or whatever else, or you can change, but you don't have to change, they're lost. It's just that simple, you know? And I just find it interesting that even, even when you have the new covenant comes in, come in, which is not what we have today, but even then, when God says, you know, I mean, we didn't have God's laws written into our heart and mind and things and, and whatever, that didn't happen with us. This is, this is an even better covenant in some ways, because these people aren't going to be sinning because God's laws and everything is just written right into their mind and into their heart. And they're not going to have to, to try to witness to people because they're all going to be believing in the Lord. You know, that's what the, the whole new covenant is all about. And even then, they still have enough that they can remember their old life and loathe that old life. Very interesting. But finally, let's go to... Ezekiel chapter 37, verse 20 through 28. <clears throat> and the sticks whereon thou writest shall be in thine hand before their eyes. And say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen, whither they be gone, and will gather them on every side, and bring them into their own into their own land. And I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel, and one king shall be king to them all. And they shall be no more two nations, neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms any more at all. Neither shall they defile themselves any more with their idols, nor with their detestable things, nor with any of their transgressions. But I will save them out of all their dwelling places, wherein they have sinned, and will cleanse them, so shall they be my people, and I will be their God." And David my servant shall be king over them, and they shall all and they all shall have one shepherd, and they shall they shall also walk in my judgments and observe my statutes and do them, and they shall dwell in the land that I have given unto Jacob my servant, Abrahamic covenant, in other words, wherein your fathers have dwelt, and they shall dwell therein, even they and their children and their children's children forever, and my servant David shall be their prince forever. Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them. It shall be an everlasting covenant with them. And I will place them and multiply them and will set my sanctuary in the midst of them forevermore. My tabernacle also shall be with them. Yea, I will be their God and they shall be my people. And the heathen shall know that I, the Lord, do sanctify Israel when my sanctuary shall be in the midst of them forevermore. Everlasting covenant. The first Mosaic covenant was conditional on those people, the Jewish people. They broke it. So God said, okay, that covenant is disannulled. They broke that covenant, but I still remember it. I still remember the law that I gave to Moses. I still remember my servant Moses, and I'm going to bring that back someday, but it's going to be a better covenant, a new covenant. And it has nothing to do with the Gentiles at all. It's for the house of Israel, for the house of Judah. So that's going to be it for this study. I'm going to do another one here. I'm going to be showing uh, 
some of the differences between the King James Bible, you know, and these new Vatican versions. So uh, don't fall for anybody that tries to tell you that the new covenant has come in or replacement theology or God's done with the nation of Israel or whatever else. That's a lie. Okay? Thank you for watching.